right, everyone. Welcome to the STOA. The baddest man on the internet, Patrick Ryan, returns. Uh, I imagine most people here know Pat had a good run with his Dark Stoa series, which had a total of 18 sessions, uh, and they were artistically executed. And for those who were paying attention, ended in a pretty uh, epic fashion. Uh, so our boy Pat is back to talk about aliens. Uh, and I believe there was a congressional uh, UFO report that just got released. And I think the wording that they had on it was that there's no evidence that there, uh, uh, that these UFOs that they're spotting were actually from aliens, but they couldn't rule it out either. Um, so what if aliens actually exist? This is the, the question that Pat's going to ask and uh, give a sense of the possibility space. Uh, so how today's going to work. Uh, if you have any question, uh, so Pat's going to present first of all. If you have any question, put them in the chat. Uh, keep it clean in the chats, and uh, I will call on you. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Um, you ask your question to Pat. If you don't want to be on YouTube, because this will be on YouTube, just indicate that, and I'll read your question on your behalf. So that being said, Pat, welcome back to the STOA. You're, you're on mute. Howdy, folks. Good to see you all again. It's... Um... Usually I don't like to voice my opinion on every little weird thing that happens in the media narrative, but this one has been kind of something I've long held to myself. I uh, didn't really see it too relevant to what uh, the Dark Stoa stuff was going on, but it is a fun epistemological journey. And there's a long history of the epistemology of the, epist the epistemological examination of the concept of aliens, extraterrestrials, interdimensional creatures, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of it is street epistemology, but there's actually a history behind it, even in the Western philosophical tradition. So we're going to start there tonight. Uh, we're going to bounce into the consumer experience of aliens, how those two do not mismatch and how those two do not match at all. And then we're going to get into some of the more option trees, bringing an economic analysis to the possibility of aliens, as in they have to have an economic incentive, either they do or they don't. So that's something I would like to rule out at first. Um, with that said, uh, that's the preparation. So let's, let's start this funny show, shall we? Share my screen. Boop. All righty. Apex aliens. We'll explain why I use that phrase in particular. Sorry, my, there we go. Uh, why you should want to be alone in this universe. The idea of aliens existing should terrify you to the core. Uh, hopefully by the end of this uh, presentation, you'll resonate a bit more with my thinking on this one or be able to properly contend against it. So um, let's get started why this is even happening. It's big hype about aliens recently. Everybody's favorite white President Obama is out there saying new religions could happen if aliens were discovered. That's, that's impressive. Uh, you know, how the hidden history of how Washington embraced UFOs going from Roswell was a weather balloon to, hey, now wait a second, maybe these things are real. That's quite the leap in a 70-year period when you really get down to it. It took the church much longer to admit that Galileo was right. Uh, then we move on to... Uh, the Pentagon's out there doing their thing. UFOs are real. Of course they're real. They're unidentified flying objects. It could be, you know, it could be other nations' craft or experimental private jets or who knows what it could be, right? So, yeah, that's possible, too. And everybody's favorite conspiracy guy, he's even out here talking about this stuff way back when in 2018. He answers no, but no to which question? No, we're alone or no to Roswell? That's not really clear. Always ambiguous, that guy. So I'd like to bring it back to... To, to the Western philosophical tradition and getting started with the way back times of Greece, of uh, everyone, oops, a second, give it a click, to Anaximander, whose name I can't pronounce unless I'm looking at the name. Um, he basically is a student of Thales, big, big influence for me. I always love Thales. Um, and he is talking about the obsession with the four elements, which are fire, wind, water, and money. And he's talking about that there's something beyond that. There's something beyond these elements. He doesn't know what it is. There's emotion about them. Um, there's a principle about them. It's as if they have a separate property outside of the ones we're defining. And he's calling it the unlimited, meaning without limit. There's something going on in this little red box. He's saying that it is neither water nor any other so-called elements, but some other nature, which is unlimited. Out of this comes to be all the heavens and all the worlds in them. By going beyond elements, post-elemental thinking, He's now opening the door in which there are many heavens and there are many worlds within them. So he's basically laying the groundwork that other experiences 
can exist. Other civilizations can exist. Other species, other worlds, right? He's laying that original argument right there simply by going beyond elements. Now, this would be later embraced by the Stoics, interestingly enough, Epicurus in particular, um, but it would be contended against heavily by Aristotle. In fact, his argument, again, this was a sound argument, both there's some truth in, well, I wouldn't say truth, but there's definitely some, some good framing in these arguments, given the limitation of what they have at the time. And basically, Aristotle's argument is stating that, yes, there may be an unlimited, but look, if things are going to exist, they're still reliant upon the things that make them real. So if the unlimited is to exist, and it's a property of these post-elemental constructs, um, then that unlimited can be just, then that unlimited is possible to be destroyed. The argument was that it's unlimited, so therefore it cannot be. And so if there was a property of unlimited in all of these elements, then elements could not be destroyed. That was his reasoning. And yet you can just simply point and look and say, well, you know, air, air is, you know, for instance, air is cold, water moist and fire hot. These things are wiping themselves out all the time. Uh, so if there's an unlimited component of these things, it's not in the elements. He didn't say that the, that the, uh, the unlimited didn't exist. He just said that it wasn't in the elements. Um, and so as a result, he's shutting down the line of argument about many planets existing. And he's one of the very first people to deny that aliens could be possible. It's Aristotle, surprisingly. He didn't know he was doing this, but he was, you can't posit aliens if they're, you can't imagine other worlds. So this is kind of like a chain of reasoning. Right? You have to start with many worlds being a thing, then you can get the aliens. So he's just denying the ability of other worlds existing. So this, this kind of argument rages for a bit uh, throughout ancient Greece. A lot of the subsequent students would pick and choose their fights in this space. And then it would kind of like die out when the dark, when, when the Romans came along and it would kind of sit, sit idle in the dark ages. Uh, then the church comes along, does their thing. Um, and in the process, the church is gathering its power, trying to reunite what's left of the Romans while contending against the, Byzant uh, the, the rising Byzantiums. And as, you, as you're a pope, I, I dare say that it's a tough job to be a pope. Because you have to come up with, you have to observe every single tedious event going on in, in Christendom. And you come up with these decrees that you can't possibly be held accountable for, but you're going to see the results of it like 30, 40 years down the line. And maybe some other pope will deal with it. That's the best way you can really look at this stuff. No matter how tedious it is, like, is this thing a sin? Uh, yeah, sure. Leather shoes are a sin. Fine, whatever. All the way up to, hey, by the way, usury is a sin. Oh, man, that's a, that's, a jump. that's a huge jump, right? So from the very boring to the very important, you're, you're issuing these decrees as if you're, you're Megatron, as if you're the word of, as if you're the mouth of God himself, and people are going to listen. And if they're not, that's what the, you know, the, swords, the swordsmen on horseback are for. Um, and so the, uh, there's some argumentation that is actually interfering with some of the previous Pope's decrees at this time. And some of the solutions that are being proposed, a lot of people are pointing to Aristotle. They're saying, no, Aristotle actually dealt with this based on our research. He's actually answered all these things. We can use his framework for guidance. But the problem, he's a heathen. He's not Christian. He's way back when. We're not going to bring him in here. Come on. He's sus. Now, there's, there's a couple of popes who were open to the idea of bringing Aristotle frameworks in, but they didn't know how to do it. And that's where St. Thomas Aquinas comes in. He comes in and says, no, we can merge Arist Aristotelian logic with Christianity. We can do this, and I'm going to show you how to do it. And he brings it together, and that's it. He did it. So there it is. Aristotle and the church are now merged at the hip in terms of reasoning on these decrees and reasoning on policies of the church. This, unfortunately, this simple move unlocks the entire autism capacity of Europe. And they proceed to spend the next multiple centuries attacking this relationship. The relationship between Aristotle and the church, they're not necessarily attacking the church. That's what most people don't get. They're actually attacking the, the binding of Aristotle and the church. Uh, even Martin Luther, the very first breaker of churches, he hated Aristotle, hated that motherfucker, couldn't stand him. Go ahead, read up his shit. He is laying into Aristotle, protecting him as stupid. This is stupid. You're stupid. Here's 95 reasons why you're stupid. I mean, he just goes all out, right? And it's, it starts with this guy. He really lays it out, doesn't hold back in the slightest. And then Galileo Galilee comes along and says, oh, there's no other worlds. There's no other planets. Check it out. I got a telescope. I'm looking at the moon, you fucking idiot. 
So like, he, like, and this is the level of like argumentation, how far these people are willing to take it because they hate the binding of Aristotle to the church. This would continue well after the 30 years war in the Reformation period. It would even take you all the way to, to Ludwig. You think that's logic. You're breathing Wittgenstein, who basically says all philosophical an- anal- analysis is trash. He says there's, you can't even do the philosophical analysis anymore. It's pointless. It's all, I think his exact words were, um, it's all circular. It's, it's circular referencing uh, indefinitely. So there's no way to actually get what's going on, which would, of course, meet the culmination of Jacques Derrida, the skeptic of text, uh, who would basically say, stop adding out of context stuff to historical text, you absolute fucking stands. Um, so, so this is basically that this evolution of critique against the church isn't necessarily always against the church. It is against the binding of Aristotle to the church. That's where shit really pops off and goes really nuts in terms of, in terms of aggregation and trying to find flaws in, in Christianity to pack. But again, this only matters because Aristotle is denying the existence of multiple worlds. Maybe that was the reason for these critiques. Maybe it wasn't. But it certainly played a role in one capacity or another, especially with Galileo Galilei. So this is the, the Western philosophical experience with aliens, although they didn't know they were talking about aliens. They were dealing with the pre-construction of aliens, meaning other worlds have to exist first. So they spent like centuries on this problem. It's ridiculous. Uh, now, when the advent of um, the printing press and books and radio shows, TV, movies, now we can shift into the more American argument about aliens. So we're, we're going to leave the philosophical discussion. And we're going to step exclusively into the American consumer perspective, which most of us, whether we're American or not, most certainly have plenty of Excuse me. Meanwhile, the poor Pope, you know, what the fuck did I do? Oh, my God, I regret everything. Um, So the consumer history of aliens, I'm breaking it into taxonomies that are extremely easy to dismiss and uh, critique. By all means, send me emails and call me an idiot. I'm okay with this. I'm just trying to drive a point for the sake of making my next point. So the... There are plenty of people who will simply say, wow, there's, you know, aliens uh, kind of existed in in other times, uh, Japanese history and Arab history. And yeah, fine. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Great. They did. Right. I'm talking about the consumer experience of aliens. And I'm pinpointing that exclusively to the British Empire. So the concept of aliens in the consumer experience where it starts absolutely most definitely comes from the British Empire. Uh, H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds. There's a radio show about that. A fake invasion was a radio show in like the 20s. It scared the shit out of people. They thought real aliens were coming after them. Uh, you had Old Stapleton with Star Maker, Edgar Burroughs with John Carter of Mars, uh, which Disney did a remake of. I thought it was okay. It wasn't too bad. It wasn't a hit, but you know, it's a fun little movie to drink to. Um, but anyway, these are, these are civilizational aliens. And wh- why I call them civilizational is because they reflect the anxieties of the British Empire. So at that time, they're at their peak. They're contending against other empires that are just as sufficient. The French, they're going after the Germans. They're going after um, a non-European empires that aren't necessarily empires, but the pains in the ass. Uh, that could be China. That could be Japan. Um, they're, they're, they, these civilizational anxieties are amounting, ama- amassing, and it's showing in these early sci-fi works. In fact, almost all the aliens being described in here are coming from a civilizational aspect. Meaning it's not just weirdos that are bald flying around in, 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 in you know, saucers. Uh, these are coordinated civilizational millions upon millions of entities working together with fully functional economies uh, contending against other civilizations. I've always preferred this perspective because it shows like the depth of how far you have to think about uh, aliens to even you know, consider you know, the vastness of the possibilities here. Uh, but this obviously falls out of style, uh, mostly because of World War I. So, whoops, you know, you start slaughtering all your males who are educated in this stuff and nobody thinks about it anymore. Oh, it's a secret trick, right? Uh, then we end up in, again, because of World War I, we get to the cosmic horrors. Now, I also include extra dimensional species into the definition of aliens. They don't necessarily have to be off planet. And even then, if you're extra dimensional, you're probably off planet anyways. So there's two concepts of aliens that find themselves in in common culture from the consumer experience. The first one is Aleister Crowley. Yes, that Satanist that everybody knows, uh, the the concept of lamb. This dude right here, I don't have my laser on. Why don't I have my laser on? Hold on, folks. I need my laser. Oh, no. Oh, no. One second, guys. I don't have it. 
whatever. I'm just going to have to do my mouse. Anyway, uh, this critter is something that Alexander Crowley, uh, uh, Alistair Crowley and uh, the other person whose name I forget, they decided to have a, a, a spiritual trip um, and decided to see this vision as if it was a voice of, of the divine or a voice of another spirit world. And said, excuse me, it was an extra, uh, extra dimensional creature that they saw. Now this, this face should look really familiar. Uh, in fact, almost all the aliens from Roswell and up you've ever seen literally have this face. That's not an accident. We'll get into that later. Then we have the other uh, critter that everybody loves, uh, Cthulhu, who's, who's out there drinking everybody's sanity because it's delicious. This is, again, a cosmic horror. Uh, cosmic horror means something that you cannot even conceive of. You will never know its motives. You will never know its intentions. Um, it is outside of your capacity to make sense, logic, emotion, or any type of connection with. It is literally beyond you, and could, you just have to reconcile that it even exists. Uh, that's, a, that's a cosmic horror. So, so these are the, the, the evolution of consumer history is somehow always reflecting what's going on in, in Europe to some degree. Uh, bounce around to the, the power loss in Europe, to the rise of America, and we get two totally different uh, definitions of sci-fi. We get science fiction, emphasis on fiction, and then we get science fiction, emphasis on science. So you'll see like uh, Flash Gordon being that fiction element, storytelling, uh, heroic movements, bright colors, uh, heroic pacing, that type of stuff. Um, pulp fiction stuff ends up in here too. A lot of the pulps are all over this uh, field. And then you get like the meaningful, well-intentioned scientists, or at least science advocates like Arthur C. Clarke and everyone he's ever inspired, which is everyone you've ever heard uh, from all things science fiction. This is much more scientific in its analysis and primarily a humanist definition of science meaning we're doing science for the sake of making our lives better, uh, not doing science for the sake because it's fucking awesome. Um, and so th this is the kind of original arc of the consumer history of, of aliens, which brings us to military aliens, mostly because of World War II. You may have heard the band Foo Fighters. Uh, maybe I'm just too old, but the idea of Foo Fighters comes from the uh, Department of Defense. That's what they would call the experimental Nazi aircraft that, that fighters would, account, would encounter. They had no designation for them. The, the Nazis were, were experimenting with all manner of flying craft, including fixed wing stuff that nobody even knew was possible. The, the, the fun name that the airmen called it were Foo Fighters. It's just a flippant little dismissal phrase to make it, less, to make it seem less threatening. Instead of saying, holy shit, that thing is doing something I don't know, we'll just give it a a dismissing name and go ahead and drive your spitfire into it and you know get toast but uh if this is uh this little panorama is coming from roswell so you'll see the that cute little anti-gravity bell design everybody knows when it comes to aliens and that type of stuff and of course speaking of roswell the actual roswell event i, I bind that with the military because of the military overlap happened on an air force base you see right here in the roswell daily record that you know it did happen and then here's a dude pointing to oh it's just a weather balloon right so they're, they're also distinct from civilizational aliens, civilizational being every aspect of civilization. This is military aliens. So this is like the military authorities at the time because of World War II, a lot of people deferred to them. And so now they have a shot at kind of like planting their flag in this consumer alien mythology that everybody's digesting. And, and most interestingly, before I move on, most interestingly, uh, when Roswell happened, it wasn't that you know, nobody really cared. It wasn't until after... Um, that military authority was crushed after the 60s with Vietnam, that people started looking through uh, the annals of history and, and found reasons to kind of gloat and, and mock uh, that military authority, which of course the boomers did in, in huge numbers uh, in the late 60s and the 70s, primarily because of the failures of Vietnam. Um, in between that phrase, uh, in between that phase, we get to the multiculturalism aliens, Gene Roddenberry's utopia Star Trek, where it's a benevolent human species and compatible aliens going from planet to planet, resolving the conflict without using too much force, uh, using lots of logic and using lots of sociological analysis. Um, this idea that it's our job to bring um, uh, <laughs> equality to the universe, uh, that, that is almost uh, exclusively the Star Trek ideal. Uh, being being promoted at that point. It's lovely, it's it's tasteful, and I absolutely hated Star Trek as a kid, and, I, and you guys are going to hate me for that. I just always did. Um, George Lucas shows uh, another version of that, in, uh, of that interpretation, although not so much, but it's really implied. They don't beat you. He, Lucas doesn't beat you over the head with the multicultural element, like the way that Star Trek does. He's much more subtle about it. So, you know, the, the one of the famous scenes in the cantina here where it shows the aliens are just 
that are have just as bad relationships with alcohol as you do, um, and they are uh, you know doing their best to get through the day. Um, it's not actually spelled out that the empire is hyper racist. It's never spelled out until like you know until later later on in the films, like many 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 years on. But it is a pro human ultra humanist faction. They don't have aliens in the empire. They have, you know, mercenaries and stuff like that, but the, but the serving officers, the serving soldiers, nope, they're all humans. So it's implied that they're racist without actually spelling it out. So it's, so it's showing two different types of, of multiculturalism going on in these, in these uh, areas. And of course that makes sense. It's the 60s, 60s and 70s. America is about to roll out globalism. We're gonna make friends with everybody. It's gonna be a perfect time. We're all making money, woohoo, multiculturalism. And so, of course, again, the sci-fi reflects the zeitgeist of the time. In between the space monster phase and the multiculturalism phase, there is a golden era of sci-fi. And not just sci-fi for aliens, but sci-fi for every conceivable thing you can think of. Literally a grab bag, uh, a random generator of sci-fi golden era stuff just being churned out. That's almost too numerous to mention here. So I'm just going to actually kind of chalk it all up to multiculturalism. And again, these are categories you can fight me on and that's fine, I can take it. Um, there is a huge shift um, in this era where we make the exchange from, we're being nice with everybody and we're building out this American globalism empire to now we're shifting into finance. We're shifting into big amounts of finance um, the Reagan era comes along, the very concept of aliens changed, there's some disillusionment in what the hippies did, uh, the, the promises they made aren't being met, there's all kinds of poverty, so now we're just, you know, this, this trajectory that was promised to us, we're not actually buying anymore, we're going we're gonna to reinvent aliens, but we're going to do so in a way that is um, palatable to the person. So instead of these high-minded concepts and using aliens as a proxy to kind of explain this, uh, we are now going to explain aliens exclusively in a homocentric, uh, anthropom anthrop anthropomorphic way. So let's take these space monsters, for example, the Xeno from Aliens or the, or the uh, Hydralisk from, from Starcraft or the Tyranid from Warhammer 40k. These are all things that aren't cosmic horrors. You can understand these things. They want to eat you. They want to kill you. They are monsters. They are designed to look terrifying. Everything about these creatures is designed to hack the human limbic system. That's the point. That's what a space monster is. Infiltrators. Michael Crichton's The Sphere, if you never read that book, I recommend it. It's fantastic. It's the idea of an alien species wiping out intelligent species on other planets by dropping, uh, spoiler alert, sorry, uh, by dropping a sphere that whatever you think of, the sphere will physically create. And as a result, the intelligent species fight one another on the planet for control of that sphere until they wipe themselves out. It's a fantastic book, I recommend it. Uh, the Arrival, not the recent one, which was fantastic, but the Charlie Sheen one that was low budget, hilarious, hilarious film. Um, the idea that uh, aliens are secretly understanding human beings well enough to infiltrate their government to cause global warming so that they can create Florida real estate for themselves so they have somewhere to retire because the temperatures are higher and they need higher temperatures. Absolutely ridiculous premise, but the point is that these are infiltrators. These are aliens that have understood human psychology and are hacking it. Of course, E.T., the, the, the childhood favorite of, of everybody, at least born in the late 70s. Um, empath, the empathic alien, an alien that has our best interests at heart, trying to uh, uh, resonate with us as humans do, even though it's not a human, is showing us that even non-humans are more human than us, so get your shit together. Uh, these are aliens are kind of the, the, the empaths are again, all of these are examples of the shift to the to the anthropomorphic alien as opposed to the, the, the alien as the vehicle of, of, uh, of high minded concept delivery. Collaborators again x files was a huge popular site case for a long time. Uh, it actually ended because of 9-11. It was very hard to raise government skepticism after 9-11. So the show just kind of ended as a result. Uh, but it was, had a good well over 10 year run. Um, it, it was a grab bag of every conspiracy known to man. Um, and it showed the aliens and government and authorities and multinationals working together. So they're collaborating. They're not necessarily infiltrating as much as they're covering each other's backs. And then the absurdists, you have Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and, and Rick and Morty, where, where it's not cosmic horror and it's, it's not space monsters. It's just that 
any version of aliens you can come up with um, will always defy your expectations. There's, there's no point in even categorizing any further. So this is kind of like a catch-all. So we've, we, you cover the, the basic anthropomorphic associations. And now we have this absurdist catch-all where we still leave ourselves wiggle room to, to explore more things that we previously didn't get to. And then finally, ugh, I hate this construct the most, the advanced primitives. The advanced primitives are a rehash of, of uh, Rousseau. Uh, the noble savage from Rousseau in the 1700s, 1800s. Um, this is the Navi from Avatar and the Protoss from Starcraft, where they don't have the technology that we humans have. No, these are wiser and smarter aliens. They never went down the road of industrialism. No, that was polluting and bad for everything they did. Instead, they were psychic, you see. And by being psychic, they rebuild all of their technology around their psychic powers. So that actually makes them more advanced, even though they don't look it. That's the entire argument of the advanced primitive. And this is literally peak globalism. This is the idea that you run out of markets to conquer. So now we're just going to jump into cultures that barely left the Stone Age and drop cell phones on them. That's kind of the, that's kind of the, the rationale behind the advanced primitive. And it acts as cover for that narrative as well. And it's the advanced primitive that is the most predominant the most predominant out of all of these, of these consumer-based aliens. And just to give you a rundown of how dominant it is, you've seen all of these archetypes before, this skull that's running around in the Nazca Plains with a bump on it like the ancients didn't have genetic anomalies or disorders, give me a break. Or the idea that there's no way that a person could have carved this out of stone even though we've gone over the fact that brains were seen as sperm tanks throughout most of history and you can't envision a bigger sperm tank, give me a break. No way that the ancients saw the sun and would create art based off of it. No, it must be an alien, right? So, oh man, drawing lines in the dirt. Oh, aliens, obviously. Come on, guys. I, geez, that's so, that's so impressive. And, psh, come on. There's no way the ancestors had 15 people to drag these things into place. And I say 15 because they were able to recreate uh, putting these things up with 15 people. Of course, we all know ancient people didn't have 15 spare people lying around because advanced primitivism, right? And no way Africans did this. That's impossible. That's the most common thing you'll see with the, with the advanced primitivism uh, um, archetype. It's, it's all ridiculous. It's all bought into. And I'm sure all of you have seen at least one of these uh, in your travels. And it's absolutely an abuse of, <laughs> it's an, it's an abuse of, of narrative um, cherry picking, basically. So we've seen the flaws, or at least the, the, the contention that the Western philosophical tradition has come up with when dealing with many worlds. And we've seen some of the more transition insanity that's happened in the American consumer tradition of aliens. Both of these things are pretty bad to describe what the fuck is going on with these alien things that are happening now, right? They're both pretty bad. One is rooted in just this like geopolitical shenanigans between the Pope and non-Pope uh, and then this one is, is just rooted on basic storytelling tropes. So th these, are not, these are not sufficient vehicles to actually explore uh, whether aliens are real or not. Um, so this changes with the advent of a fun little guy by the name of Enrico Fermi. Uh, Fermi. So Enrico Fermi, he was chased from Italy to America by Mussolini's race policies. His wife was Jewish. Mussolini said next to that, and he said, fuck you, I'm just going to America, where he proceeds to become the architect for the atomic bomb to get his revenge. Smugvengeanceface.jpg, please watch The Necessity of Revenge to understand the importance of Enrico Fermi. So Enrico Fermi comes along, and he's at the Los Alamos, uh, the Los Alamos not institute, the place where they make the nukes, but he was there in the 50s after they made them. So he has two, he has like three other scientists he's, he's talking to. And the conversation goes like this. You know, Fermi has entered the chat, Teller has entered the chat. Fermi, how probable is it within the next 10 years that we shall have clear evidence of a material object moving faster than light? Teller says one in a million. Fermi, that's way too low. Probability is more like 10%. Fermi leaves the chat. So he basically asks Teller a question and then you know, goes about his day. Comes back a few hours later, re-enters the chat, goes full Alex Jones and says, where are they? Hold on, what the fuck is he talking about? How do you ask that question and then you come back to your coworkers and just lose your shit, right? The coworkers reportedly laughed very hard when they heard him do this 
But meanwhile, Enrico Fermi was just, <laughs> was just losing his noodle at this very concept. He couldn't quite figure it out. Um, and what did he do? Why was he doing this? What, what, what did he mean by this, right? So I want to kind of walk through this. This is called the Fermi Paradox. It's the world's favorite existential dread simulator. So I want to walk through the option tree where he goes from moving faster than light to where are they? Because there's a pretty good option tree here. So we start with the concept of, I don't say speed of light because there is too much loaded shit around that. I don't like it. I want to take Einstein's exact words. I want to say a photon is carrying the inertia from an emitting to an absorbing body. That's his exact words. So I'm just going to say, can a photon convey infinite inertia between emitting and absorbing bodies? Because that's an analog for speed of light without saying speed of light. And when you frame it like that, all these dumb opinions that people have melt at the wayside and I don't have to deal with it. So can a photon uh, convey infinite inertia? It's a yes or no question. So let's say no, it can't, right? So Einstein and Lorenz is correct. They've correctly defined the dimensions of our eternal prison. And here we are stuck with each other forever, including with me, my apologies. What if it was, right? Yeah, maybe they can do it. Yes, there's some magical shit going on and humans are too stupid to figure out. Let's leave that open. Now you might notice the color theme that I'm going for. Green means good for humanity. Red means bad for humanity. So just keep that in mind as I go through this stuff. Maybe there's another way. Maybe we don't need magical shit. Maybe there's a resting frame for the universe that's preferred if we wanna channel some science here. You can actually click on that link and actually take you to a white paper that does a pretty good job laying the case for a resting frame that's universal in preference. Uh, so either science or magic leads us to the same question. Have the A's figured it out? I mean, if they can convey a photon you know, faster than the speed of light, have they figured it out? That's the next logical question. No, they're too stupid and we're lucky to have this head start. So let's spend it arguing with each other on the internet. Or maybe yes, all the A's I know are crazy smart. Of course they figured it out, right? Again, red's bad for us. So that leads us to the next round. Have the A's figured out a way to exploit this for transportation? I'm kind of taking this very iteratively, but bear with me. Um, because again, if you can move a photon faster than the speed of light, it makes sense. You will probably iterate towards making, you know, a neutron move faster than the speed of light and so forth and so on. Let's say, no, they're still working on it. Or maybe they blow themselves every time, blow themselves up every time they try to do it. That's actually pretty good for us. Hell yeah, they figured it out. Duh, I've seen all the sci-fi in the world. Let's run with it. All right, let's run with that option tree. Is there a limit to the speed or distance such an exploit can transport A's? Meaning just because you can go faster than the speed of light doesn't mean you didn't hit another limit. It just means you're going faster than that current one, right? If we, if we, take, if we think in static terms for the sake of the option tree at least. So is there a limit? Yes. There is a limit, but it's not coming from science. It's coming from physical, economic, or political processes imposing some type of regulation. So the means of creating that way to go faster than the speed of light are actually feeding back into um, the systems that control those means. And it's at a contention point. So they're not actually, they can go faster than light, but there's a lot of internal uh, instability to do so consistently. But that's still bad for us or say, no, they're literally magically teleporting everywhere without limitation at all times, right? So that's an argument you hear a lot because people don't think this far into it. So in both cases, whether it's yes or no, we're actually quite fucked. That's pretty sad. Okay, so we, we determined that if there, there's either limits or there isn't, and no matter what the answer to that is, it leads us here. Does that travel leave any evidence? Does, is there any infrastructure that they need to make the travel possible? And does that leave any evidence? Again, it's not like I can go to my faster than light tree, go chop off a fruit and then eat it and then magically teleport somewhere. Maybe that is how it works. I don't know. But I do know that if you are running a civilization and people can go faster than the speed of light, not only will they, but they will depend upon going faster than the speed of light. It will be the only way to actually maintain a competitive advantage with the limited resources you have. And we're not done yet. We still haven't gotten from can a photon go faster than the speed of light to Enrico Fermi uh, imitating Alex Jones. So now, starting at this question, does travel leave evidence? Let's just assume no, everything they do leaves no impact on the human perceivable dimension. It's a possibility. I won't rule it out, but it's a possibility. But let's say it does leave evidence. Yes, everything is still dependent on that which makes it real, which is the Aristotle argument. So something like alien pollution should exist. 
if I'm building a civilization, I'm, I'm building pollution. It's got to be somewhere. Just got to look for it, right? So have we found any evidence of astro civilizations that span the stars the way we span land? And there's Enrico Fermi. This is as far as Enrico Fermi got. He's losing his mind. Tell me where they are. Or I'll literally nuke you. He's done it before. He'll do it again, goddammit. He's crazy. So you got to tell him where these aliens are. No, we've only found what we think are signatures of astro civilization. We can't do a hard no to that question. We have to say, well, we think we found something. Or you can say, yes, but it's hidden from every authority sector on the earth, X-Files style. No matter the answer to that, it still leads to the same question. Are there natural predators of an astro civilization? Again, if these things are spreading everywhere, whether you know it or not, is there a predator? Because if there isn't, it would be an invasive species. Just like when you drop an animal in the middle of Australia and there's no predators against it, it just consumes everything it can because there's nothing to stop it. The same thing would happen here. If there are no natural predators of an astro civilization, it just spreads everywhere. And so you say, yes, the most logical answer is other astro civilizations. That's the correct answer. That is what would hold something in check like that. But again, that loops us back. Have we found any evidence of astro civilizations? And around and around we go. So now we're trapped in this loop. But let's say uh, there may be some unknown process or inherent limitations which check their apex status. Again, feasible and ultimately good for us. Because if these things are spreading wildly like an invasive species and something like as simple as population mechanics or economics or, or, or inherent instability is interfering with that spread, then that's possible and ultimately very good for us. And then there's an easy answer in which you say, no, for the first one to actually break out and do it, there wouldn't be any natural predators or one that was sufficiently isolated. I point to the example of, of the South Americans and the Spanish. That's why if, we, if we reframe this entire option tree along their frame of reference, then we'll see that there's no way that the South Americans could have detected the Spanish civilization. There's literally no way, and yet they still existed. But by the time they did collect evidence of it, what they did is they collected a fragment of the Spanish civilization, those ships when they rolled up, that was just a fragment of it. And even if they got rid of those ships, there are an entire series of economic incentives to produce more ships to keep them coming, no matter what you did. So by the time you saw the messenger, the messenger was a reflection of the entire infrastructure that put that messenger in front of you. So that's, this is an example where even if you have no evidence of aliens, um, they can still have that first strike advantage. Um, I don't know why that's green. I shouldn't have made that green. It's definitely bad. Um, and so these, so the next question is, if they're running around either unchecked or checked, because in, in this scenario here, they're checked. In this scenario, they're not checked. They're just spreading about collecting all the resources they can. Do they consume material resources to maintain their astro economy? Meaning, I've had this argument with people where I say, do aliens have stomachs? They say, yes, well, obviously they consume to live. So that's probably an issue for us. They turn around and say, no, they're plant-based absorbing the light. I don't know. Um, but the thing is, even if you say that, they are still relying on some degree of technology, machinery, processes that are consuming things, that are burning or generating pollution. It's just inevitable. So if you're spanning all of these stars, you're, you're going to leave a trace just, again, on your consumption habits, your consumption patterns, especially if you're Apex. Now, let's say, that, let's say they don't consume you know, material resources. They drink light and pee rainbows. They've defeated entropy, and uh, they leave no Im environmental impact. And we're just, our minds are too stupid to figure it out. Well, congratulations. This answer leads to the same answer where they leave no impact on human perception. We're no longer talking about aliens. We're talking about fucking angels. And there's no way to separate them from vacuum energy and background radiation. So now that people who followed that train go to the theos, go to, go to, the, go to uh, the theological arguments, go ahead and reconcile that you're not talking about angel, uh, aliens, you're talking about angels. Go to that place because you're no longer possible, you're no longer capable of adding anything to the material discussion going on here. So go to angel land and, and figure out some stuff there. That's fine. There's a role for that, there's a place for that, but from here on out, there isn't. So if these apex aliens consume material resources to maintain their economy, if the answer is yes, these assumptions of high-tech mastery and astroeconomic relies means resource consumption is bad for us, obviously, because now they're going to be competing against us. Will they ever interfere with our own resource consumption? Ugh, that's bad. 
Because if the answer is yes, purge the Xeno scum from the name of the, of the God Emperor, because it's going to get bad. And if no, I'm sure we'll find a way to cooperate with them, despite them having extreme cosmic power projection disparities between us. Slavery is technically co- cooperation, isn't it? So it's, it's not a good way to be if these things exist. Um, there's, this is something that has plagued a lot of my machinations over the years. These two outcomes, uh, they bother me greatly. They bothered Frank Herbert greatly. Um, and it's, it's not a pleasant place to go. It's a good thought experiment, but oh man. And, and not, even, not even Fermi got this far. Uh, but I want to focus on this one. Do aliens consume material resources to maintain their astro economy? I think that's a good question because it brings a sense of realism on where you can look to find these things before we get too far off into the weeds, even more so than we already have. So in astroeconomics, aliens got to trade just like we do to survive. There's no one planet that's going to produce everything any astroeconomic empire needs. It's impossible. Uh, there's just no magical place that, that, that hits all the notes at the same time. So let's, so let's walk through that. And I think my AU scales are bad here. Just assume the appropriate AU scales, which are astronomical units, something, an absurd number, whether it's 20 or 20K, just some ridiculous number. I, maybe I made a typo here, my apologies. So this planet has been extracted using these faster than light creatures who can move between planets and move goods between planets. They can move it from planet A to planet here, right? And this planet is just known for its metals. It's, it's dumping metals. And this one's dumping water. And this one's, you know, dumping compute capability. You know, whether it's some plant that, that sits there and thinks really hard or a computer, you know, pick your flavor of compute, doesn't really matter. Um, and each one of these are variable distances from the destination, 100 AU, 50, 20 AU, whatever the appropriate ridiculous scale should be. This planet takes all of that, creates robots that dumps it on this planet. That planet then farms with those robots and gives food to here, which then puts waste to here, right? So that's just the, the example of, of this trade network. Because again, not one planet produces everything. And these planets are so damn far away from each other. Oh man, right? So we have this trade empire that's going on. And this is feasible. This is logically feasible from the sense of not only from our own planning, uh, but from trying to detect where an astro civilization would exist. You look for the trade networks, you look for the signals, you look for those types of things, right? There's one thing that throws a wrench in all this, and it's called price discovery, meaning how are they synchronizing the prices of all this shit? Because if all these things are that many light years apart, do you realize how much corruption I can get away with? I could say, well, I'm producing metal and it's going to take that planet, you know, this long for them to get information of my production. So I can just be a real dick about my price discovery and overcharge them. So now your entire astroeconomic empire is racked by corruption everywhere you go. You're nowhere near as efficient as you should be because of the speed of light delay. Even if you go faster than it, there will be something that they can be exploited because that's price discovery. Price discovery gets everything. And the arbitrage moments are amazing. You can, if, I can, if I'm on this planet and I know that these two planets are scumbag corruption, um, I can totally milk the arbitrage between these two planets and just profit from it all day long. Now, of course, this brings the fun question, and this pisses off everybody, which is why I love having this conversation. And the pre-price discovery argument, there's no way aliens use money because Star Trek, right? That's the argument you hear all the time. They don't use money. That's impossible. Only we primitive, terrible people use money. Only, only brutal people like humans use money. Aliens would never use it, right? Okay. All right. What's wrong with that? Aliens don't use money because they have robots that make everything on demand. Fair. That's what they can do. And aliens, I'm sorry, hold on. Uh, and because they have robots that make every, everything on demand, next question would be, how are they securing enough materials to perform that on-demand labor? And by the way, that labor takes time. Something to keep in mind. Another reason aliens might not use money is because markets are immoral and aliens have the exact same moral framework as I do. How lucky that is. Maybe the moral framework traveled faster than light. Aliens don't use money because they are immortal and don't value time. Another possibility. Maybe they just, they're extra dimensional and time, they just don't experience it, right? Okay, let's say time isn't the thing that they're putting value on. Do they put value on anything? Anything at all. If time's out, fine. You don't want to talk about money and time because we have very toxic relationship with money and time, fine. What do they have value on? What is it? Is it mating? Is it art? Is it religious experience? Whatever they have, they have value on something. I don't know what it is, but it's an important question. 
Because if we're going to assert that they're not using money, we have to understand what it is they actually value. And the answer is no, because everything they could ever want can instantly materialize from sheer willpower alone, think Sphere, Michael Crichton. And how are they securing enough materials to perform that on-demand labor? Right? No matter what answer you come up with, there's still this problem. So let's say they do have value on something. They do place value on something. We don't know what it is, but they do. Right? Would they place value on things they can't instantly have? Meaning, they're going faster than light. They're moving all over the universe. It's assumed they can instantly do anything they want. But is that true? Can they instantly have a, a Dyson sphere? Can they snap finger get Dyson sphere? Probably not. Can they snap finger and create a duplicate empire of themselves? Probably not. So there's something, even with all this magical tech, they can't have. And would they place value on that which they do not have? Would they have the psychology of that? Would they have the pressures and incentives to do so? Let's just say yes, because scarcity would appear even in a universe where everything can be instantly accessed. What that scarcity would look like, I have no idea. Um, but if we assume that scarcity would appear under these conditions, then yes, they would place value on something. Now, would aliens gamble on their future capacity to secure the scarce thing? And by the way, if the answer was no, it takes us right back here because it can materially instant, you know, if, if they place value on things it can't instantly have, no, that's not possible. They can instantly materialize it. How are they securing it, right? So we go right back to this chain. But would they gamble on their future capacity to secure that scarce thing? Would I say, I bet you 10 years of my life and I will sign a contract that says I owe you that 10 years if you forward me all the resources I need to go do this thing I know I can do. Do they do contracts? Do they do debt? That doesn't have to be credit. It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be Goldman Sachs. It doesn't have to be evil capitalism. It could be you know, gambling your firstborn. It could be gambling a ship. It could be gambling some game, something you value. Something you value is being gambled. It doesn't have to be money. It's just something you value, right? The answer is no, because aliens can access all timelines at the same time and don't have a concept of the future. Then it go right back to the idea of, well, what is it they're putting value on? All that means is you haven't figured out what they value. So you got you to gotta do the homework here, which leads us right back to the same question. Are they gambling on the things they value? And if the answer is yes, congratulations. We just reinvented credit and contractual obligations, just like that. No money needed, no capitalism needed, no contemporary discussion about that shit even required. It's just people saying that I know I can pull that off. And I'm, and I'm confident enough that I can do it. And I'm willing to gamble. And if you're willing to give me resources right now to hit my marks, I'll do it. And I'll, or I'll die trying. These are very simple things you can, you can gamble on. People have been doing it for, for millennia. So I'm left to conclude that aliens use money. Might not be our money. Might, probably not crypto. Elon Musk is pissed about that, I'm sure. But they're using something. They're using something to keep track of their contractual obligations. You don't want to call it money, fine. Call it sticks. Call it fucking frogs. I don't care what you call it. They're keeping track of their contracts one way or another. Now, here's the fun thing. How do they keep money supplies stable with credit demand with their astroeconomic empire spans thousands of astronomical units? Because again, transferring information is a problem with speed of light. So we flip it around. Again, we start with this new box. We say credit expansion inevitably results in credit contraction. That's the takeaway here. So let's say, how do they keep track of this? They say they're transmitting information and banking policy faster than the speed of light, which we have to, which we, the reason we've even gotten this far in this chain is because we've already accepted this. We've already accepted that they have faster than the speed of light. Otherwise, we're all stuck in our prisons here on our individual planets, right? So we just take this as is, right? But let's say they don't. Let's say maybe they don't use it. Maybe that's a grand taboo. Maybe they have experience of transmitting price information faster than the speed of light, and things got bad every time they did it. So they actually have a, maybe a religious prohibition against it. Again, completely possible. Would they experience exploits and corruption of policy enforcement based on speed of light limitations? Meaning I'm not trading at a fair value because it takes 20 years for the price information to get to you. Yeah, I can exploit that all day long. Of course I will. So if they aren't doing that, well, they're smart enough to manage an, econo uh, uh, an astro-economic empire, but they're too stupid to figure out corruption. And uh, that's, that's a burden. To, that's, a, that's a big burden to prove on my part. You know, that's, that could make a great sci-fi story or a great Rick and Morty episode, I'm not sure. But let's say, yes, 
you know, let's say uh, speed of light limits for information transmission would determine the hard boundary of price discovery. Let's accept that. So this leads to, would this limitation drive pressures to find ways around it? Meaning if I know I'm hard capped on my speed of light limitation and I have all the incentives of an astroeconomic empire to achieve more, uh, um, more faster information, Think of high frequency transactions on, on Wall Street, for example. Of course, there's pressures to get more faster information. So yes, there would be a limitation, but let's say there wasn't. Let's say no, uh, the aliens apply faster than light. Whenever they do this, it somehow always destabilizes their economic engine. That's again possible. We see this with high frequency trading algorithms. Every time they go faster than speed of light for their price discovery, it may completely destabilize them. That is completely within the realm of possibility. But let's say uh, they do it anyway. Now, they don't want to learn from their previous mistakes. They say, yeah, yeah, so they do do it. So now we're transmitting information, price information, faster than the speed of light. Here we go. Um, and, we're, and we're using the shit we agreed about a few slides back about aliens moving faster than the speed of light. We've already established that. And maybe they don't do that. Maybe it's an intelligent alignment of astroeconomic configuration to have a net AU instead of a net D. So a net D means uh, the amount of days it takes to reconcile an account. We live in a net seven in a consumer. So every seven days, all of our consumer accounts are reconciled. The British Empire, however, had a net 180, meaning it took 180 days for their accounts to reconcile. A net AU would be how many astronomical units would it take to reconcile debts and accounts, right? And maybe they structured their empire, not necessarily to transmit faster than speed of light, but to work within sub, uh, subluminal, um, uh, subluminal speeds to, to maximize it, to minimize the damage of having information of price discovery being transferred faster than speed of light. Again, all possible. Now, here's the terrible question. The absolutely terrible question. Does net AU naturally become net zero? If I can transmit price information faster than the speed of light, all that means is I will conduct my transactions faster than the speed of light which means my net seven becomes net five, becomes net three, becomes net one, becomes net microsecond, because I can resolve all the transactions in my empire within a microsecond. Eventually it becomes net zero. And when that happens, well, I have to use human models for this because every so often humans get to this point where we get the net zero. Uh, and typically when you get there, um, let's just say that Empires kick the can down the road by any means, meaning they don't want to actually pay off debts. Because if you're at a net zero, there's no way to save money. There's no way to actually save stores of value. You're transacting every single day. And by the time you do that, what happens is the value of all prices in the empire switches every day or every microsecond. So there's no way to actually plan for value storing in the future. It's impossible when you're on a net zero. We've known this as hyperinflation, for example. But if yes, they do become naturally net zero then all stores of value would be subsumed faster than they can be trusted. And then the em economic empires would fracture along stability lines, whether that's ethnic or racial or, or genomic or whatever. What kind of turmoil and expansionism would be caused from an astroeconomic empire experiencing systematic credit contraction? Meaning all opportunities gone, all prices can't be trusted, stores of value are gone. Meanwhile, you have this empire that's scattered across the stars with the most god-awful technology you can't even conceive of, and they no longer have economic opportunity, what are they going to do? Oh, God, that's horrifying. <laughs> They're going to expand recklessly and not give a hot fuck about you, me, plants, or the unicorns we've thought of. They're just going to try and find a way to stabilize their empire, just like we do. This is the hard question right here when we're talking astroeconomics. Does net AU naturally become net zero? And if it does, credit contraction is possible. And credit contraction in an astroeconomic empire is something you cannot hide. It is impossible to hide that. It would be a level of destruction you cannot even fathom. So astronomic price discovery behavior should appear as signals or at least highly correlated with organic chemistry. So SETI's out there trying to find you know, stock tips on alien markets, right? They're trying to listen to signals and, and get that sweet, you know, alpha. Eh, it didn't go so well. So we decided to pivot over to astrospectometry, uh, spectrography, 
where we're trying to figure out uh, how many photons bounce off a certain molecule to figure out, okay, is this, is this an organic compound? And if so, there's probably life here. But there, again, there's serious problems here because the light is still moving at the speed of light, uh, which is too slow. That light could have been a billion years ago. You don't know what the fuck the aliens are doing. Um, and if they're going faster than light, then we're getting old information while they're just still zipping around, right? So there's, there's, the faster than light thing is a problem. From an, astro from an astroeconomic perspective. Because if we assume that they're capable, then astroeconomic empires should be everywhere, which led Fermi to state what he stated. stated. He asked, could it be faster? He said, probably 10%, came back, said, where are they? Because if faster than light is possible, these things should be everywhere. The question was, where are they? The question now has become, why can't we find them? The blame shifts to us for not trying hard enough while we keep the widely held hope of the speed of light uh, being wrong so we can go faster than it. But if we go faster than it, then we're exposed to all the things we just walked right through. It seems that the speed of light might be a self-correcting problem if you break it. So as it turns out from the human perspective, now that we've explored the consumer and we've explored the philosophical and we've explored the game theoretic of the astroeconomics, where does this leave us in the question of do aliens exist or do they not? Well, from what I do know, uh, the consumer expectations of aliens are infinitely greater uh, than the scientific proof of aliens, for starters. Scientists can be ignored all day. It's easy. We, we don't fund them. I mean, we know how to ignore them. But the consumers, the consumer expectations, boy, those things are what drive politics, right? Those are the things that drive you know, markets and everything else. So appealing to the consumer is, is all you need to do. So when it comes to aliens, we are most certainly going to appeal to the consumer. These are corrupt scientists and our mindless consumer. We go back to Roswell. That's a weather balloon. That's not an alien. Sure it is. He's already skeptical. Look at him go on his little Walmart bike. Then we say uh, aliens might exist. You might remember the 90s where the, the hippie culture and the Rasta culture and the alien culture somehow merged into this weird meme. I'm sure some of you remember that one. And of course, the consumer knows that. He's seen a brilliant movies about them. He, he's in the know. He's a smart guy, right? Scientists change their tune yet again. Aliens exist. And here's the spaceship leads us to today, all the stuff we're talking about now. Consumer did it, he won the game. Of course, he knew it. Those movies were right, goddammit. Then let's just roll out the whole thing. Let's say aliens exist and here's a living one, right? <laughs> consumer wants to eat it. So, so there it is, that's the that's transition of science and the consumer relationship, which again is ridiculous, which is why I, I try to bring in the, the astroeconomic impact here and the astroeconomic oversight. Uh, because it's, it, it attempts to say, look, if this is a thing, then this is a thing, and we can make some you know, assessments about who's doing what. Now, even if they roll out the alien, get ready for the mic drop, folks. Even if they roll out the alien, that doesn't mean aliens exist. Here's why. By the way, here's the graph of aliens uh, being searched throughout time. Uh, it could be either alien, Roswell, or UFO, if you're curious about that type of stuff, what was popular and when. So the problem with rolling out aliens is that chimeras exist. Suppose that extraterrestrial that is able to hide their entire astroeconomic empire despite its assumed widespread dominance and having no natural predators to check their expansion across the stars. Here it is, folks, apex alien, right? Well, we can make chimera here on Earth. What's a chimera? It's where you mix species together. Here's Neanderthal brains. You've heard me rattle about them for an entire episode. Everybody take a drink. The cow tank. You should take a look at this thing. This thing's a monster. This thing's totally genetically organized, uh, engineered and organized. Look at that thing. It's, what, the, what the hell is happening? <laughs> this thing is a beast, right? World's first gene-edited baby announced by a scientist who then promptly was disappeared. And the creator of the human pig chimera. So we're well, all, well on the track of creating chimera. We know how to mix species together. We figured out how to do it. So if they roll out an extraterrestrial body, that's still not proof of an extraterrestrial. Because it could be a chimera for narrative reasons. After all, if we're talking narrative, is that what Obama said? Great new religion? Is that what the Pentagon said? Narrative? Is that what Q said? Narrative? Curious timing. You haven't ruled out the chimera problem in the UFO expo in the UFA exposition, aliens could come from here and we could have made them. 
and we're just passing them off as aliens. Which brings us to our favorite song, Muse, Exopolitics. When the Zetas fill the skies, it's just our leaders in disguise. Fully loaded satellites will conquer nothing but our minds. Thank you much. Wow. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Pat, uh, for another uh, um, mind-blowing session. Uh, so let's pivot to uh, some, Q, um, some questions. Um, Anjan, you're, you're the guy that set up this whole thing. So uh, uh, you have a few questions, so perhaps you can start us off. Uh, Pat, I have too many, so I'm just going to say a couple and you pick. Um... Okay, so the first one is, why the fuck are these UFOs visible? Um, if, they, if they're so sophisticated in their technology, why do they not use metamaterials to hide from visible light or microwave or radio? Um, that's the first one. Uh, the second one is, um, okay, this is a little more absurd, but there's like that famous Zimbabwe school example where like, I think it was 70 kids or even more claim they saw a ufo touch down and they saw a being come out of it um and what's interesting is they all had very consistent accounts where they're like the alien telepathically put images into their minds and uh what the alien told them is hey don't ruin the planet it's really valuable and technology is bad and so i gotta ask like assuming uh that's a consistent thing is there any possibility that they have potentially passed the great filter of super intelligent AI and Moloch. Um, and then maybe we can, because we can learn from their warning and we'll actually take it seriously. Uh, let me just ask those two. Okay. Uh, first one, why are UFOs visible? Uh, well, U UFOs aren't necessarily extraterrestrial. I mean, it was the cold war, lots of, lots of planes being done. I mean, the MERV vehicle, for example, the MERV is, uh, one of the most impressive things you've ever seen in engineering. It is a missile delivery system that will come from a satellite from deep under, fire off into the atmosphere, launch eight nuclear warheads strategically on any target that's been pre-programmed. If, if that delivery system was ever hacked by the Chinese, Russians, or anything else, holy shit, they can interfere and stop it, right? So there's plenty of, of Cold War incentive to come up with bullshit narratives uh, to hide the actual technology that's being developed. So that has to be accounted for in one capacity. That may explain why certain things are visible because you know it's quite literally made here. Um, there's nothing to say that aliens must be visible in the sky. In fact, the idea that we point to the sky and say aliens is kind of ludicrous in and of itself. Again, if they go faster than light, just show up. Just like, boop, just appear, you're there. You don't even need fucking ships, right? So, so it's, it's kind of meh, right? So that's a, that's a thing. And metamaterials, again, metamaterials could hide. But again, that, that assumes that a species would even want to hide. I can bounce, if I had gravitational tech, who cares if I'm hiding or not? I'd, I'll just show up and do whatever. We saw what the Europeans did to, to South America. They didn't give a fuck about hiding. Um, so then we get to the UFO touchdown, consistent accounts. I'm going to put on my tinfoil uh, hat on that one. I don't have a rational answer on, on that type of stuff. But I do have a thing you can look up. Um, I'm going to call it dream pushing technology. It's a weird one, but it's an it's electromagnetic um, conveyance device that can be uh, that can target specific parts of a mind remotely, and it can interfere with neurotransmissions uh, and other things. And there are certain examples that I can point to where, while a person is sleeping, you can actually push messages exactly like that into someone's mind so that when they wake up, they're moved by it because again, the dream is the one place where propaganda isn't supposed to work, where it actually isn't being pushed and, and you are alone are coming up with that one experience. It's the one place in your entire experience that can't be touched by other people. Therefore, you're gonna give it a high value of authoritative ship. Again, this is all Alex Jones tin, tin hat theory and I openly admit that, uh, but um, I can give you some PDFs that show that people have been working on that technology for some time. If I can sneak in a quick one, you probably explained this in your Chimera thing, but I'm just too slow to process it in real time. But um, yeah, if if um, it's like weird how consistent the accounts are, whether it's Costa Rica or Canada or 
America or the UK or whatever, whatever. Um, and they describe them as looking humanoid. Why the hell would life look humanoid? Doesn't that just seem like a quirk of the yeah. evolution on this planet? Um, exactly. God forbid it's an intelligent collective of goldfish, right? I mean, it, it's it, aliens could take any form they want. Uh, it, just to read Douglas Adams or Walter Rick and Morty, you'll see examples of how absurd it can really get. Um, uh, so the idea that they're humanoid is kind of a smoking gun to my chimera theory. So. Cool. Um, Evan, you had a question. Yeah, so Pat, I'm wondering what you think of the sort of theories, um, you know, you hear the word ultra terrestrials thrown around, like uh, Robert Anton Wilson talks about this in some of his books, the idea that there are certain underlying structural similarities between, say, like, legends of encounters with fey entities in Ireland, um, he goes into some of the African mythology too, et cetera, et cetera, um, and, and modern uh, encounters uh, with quote unquote extraterrestrials. So mm -hmm. there's this hypothesis that there's the same sort of underlying phenomenon happening to people that's being interpreted through whatever the locally available cultural lens is. So I'm curious if you could kind of connect that or if you have thoughts about that as how, is, how it connects to what you're talking about here. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the idea of phenomenon, uh, I would... I'll lay a simple tale. So Alexander the Great, I, I said this a couple of times in some stoas, but I like to throw it out there so often. Uh, he had successfully conquered, since we're talking Aristotle, right? I and mean, that's, I start opened up with Aristotle, so it makes sense I go to Alexander. So he had conquered 200 tribes with 200 languages, 200 religions, 200 cultures, 200 economies, 200 price points, all different from one another. How the fuck do you do that? How do you take that and hold it, right? That is a, that should be an impossible. Uh, the level of epistemics, of, ep ep eh, of epistemic reconciliation should make that a natural impossibility, but Alexander did it. How did he do it? Quite simple. After a fight, he would lay gigantic breastplates in the field and people would collect their bodies um, after a battle. They'd all collect the parts and then recycle them for their armies. And as the enemy or as Alexander's enemies was collecting parts, he would, they would see these massive breastplates sitting in the field. And they would be like, holy fuck, he commands giants. Because only a giant could wear that. Human couldn't wear that. It's too big. So by the time Alexander rolled up to a tribe, they'd surrender instantly because they didn't want to get stomped on by giants. So there's definitely the mythological, cap uh, the, the mythological creation capacity of a human being. Um, and then there's exploiting that for advantage, psychological advantage, market advantage, geopolitical advantage. Uh, any myth you create uh, can be exploited. And I, I will quote Voltaire, and exactly those terms. Anybody who can make a man believe in absurdities can make that man commit atrocities. So quick follow-up, just to clarify, you're basically, your theory that you're working with here is that these underlying commonalities are instances of people, groups of, of human beings, essentially, um, manipulating other human beings into believing absurdities for, you know, more or less mundane sort of like resource allocation, zero sum type purposes, and that the skill set to do this has existed for at least some thousand years or something like that, right? Yeah, we're story, we're, um, I wouldn't, it's not very, it's, you don't need a lot of sophistication to do it. Uh, we're, we're storytelling creatures and story selling, uh, story receiving creatures. Uh, spin a story, and if it's, con you know, convincing sounding, yeah. People buy it, and that changes their frame. That changes their outlook. It changes their filters. What are they looking for, right? Um, you know, er, even basic salesmen knew this. Early cults knew this. Religions learned this. Kings learned this. Um, so, the, so the story, the story element of our mind, um, is a source of our inspiration, <laughs> the source of our slavery, I guess. Uh, but um, um, again, uh, I don't say this to poo-poo on on contemporary aliens. I just spent the last some odd hour going over all the reasons why astroeconomics should exist. I can't find it. Nobody else can find it. I'm real skeptical on the concept uh, of aliens being around because I don't want them to be around. I'm, I'm pretty sure they are. I'm pretty sure they exist. I don't want them to exist. That's my bias. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at, the, I'm gonna look at the, uh, the storytelling aspect primarily first. All right. Thank you, Evan. Um, boop, boop, boop. Alex, you had a question. Alex, are you are you there? You have a good question. I can ask this question if, if his mic is out. Um, yeah. So uh, perhaps I'll, I'll read it, uh, or if you find 
Yeah, does net zero theory refute the possibility of bending space? It is a big counter and it, yep, that is exactly correct. Because if I can move price information faster than light, there is no economy, there's nothing. So yeah, it is a, it is one of those things. There may be a, if there is a, if there is an astroeconomic empire running around, they may have a grand prohibition on, on violating light speed um, because it would just completely destroy any dependencies they have in terms of pricing information. So it's, it's uh, like, imagine creating an economy where all information is perfectly known at all times um, and then try and find the tiny little exploits in delivering information from a producer to a consumer and see where that simulation takes you. Uh, you'll end up creating a black market economy more than anything else uh, because it's those exploitations and information awareness that that promotes illicit economies to move forward um, to then exploit exactly that. And then all the money channels into that. And then the economy no longer is the economy. The black market quite literally subsumes the entire economy. So the moment you get the net zero, it's just all crooks and criminals who have no interest in maintaining civilization. They just want to keep the exploits going. So that's that tends to be what happens. Uh, Bill Turnbow, um, you had a question slash comment. Uh. Hi, Pat. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Um, I had, uh, just want to keep this short. I, I want to lead off with a comment, first of all, that uh, as a uh, as a biologically limiting element, phosphorus might be a good candidate for analysis because it's I understand it's the, the least universally uh, available element that is crucial for life. Mm -hmm. So conceivably an alien civilization that has some interest in either promoting or limiting the spread of biological life would have an interest in, in like nucleosynthesis or something to get around local scarcities of phosphorus. Um, so that, that might be an interesting uh, test to, to look for background um, evidence of, you know, massive cosmic level macroeconomic activity. Um, but, but that's, that's an aside. Um, just wanted to, 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 to get your uh, a remark from you, if you would. Um, sort of bringing it a little closer to home with the, the sudden interesting um, uh, promotion of the seeming official interest in UFOs. Kind of wondering about the timing of this vis-a-vis -vis the uh, seeming reversal of the official line on the, the Wuhan lab origin theory. Look here, don't look here. Yeah, um, first uh, uh, first and foremost, I would like to introduce Bill Turnbow. For many years in Los Angeles, I had very few people to talk to and work these theories out. Mr. Turnbow has experienced all of them, so you didn't have to see the creation phase. He saw the workshop, the scrap, the failed starts. He saw literally all of them for well over a decade. So if you Please go and friend this guy. He is a sage among sages. I cannot sing his praises high enough. Um, the second is, uh, yeah, phosphorus is a bottleneck. Absolutely. Um, that, is, that, is, that would be the same way the British has surrounded themselves around oil pipelines or stuff like that, those types of bottlenecks. That's where macroeconomic activity and shenanigans would absolutely take place in, and it would be very hard to hide that stuff. That's very true. Um, regarding, you know, the look here, don't look here, well, I was on the COVID task force, one of them, and we definitely had evidence of, of weaponization of that damn stuff. So you'll see that come out in its own time. I won't have to address too much of it here, but there's definitely some smoke and mirrors afoot for sure. Any uh, follow-up, Bill? Thank you for your generous comments, Pat. Uh, that's, uh, that, 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 that's pretty much all from me. Again, uh, very thought-provoking presentation. All right, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Yuli, can I uh, take you in? Can you read your question? Um... Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so I guess there's two separate questions here. And so one is, uh, 
more about conjecture on like aliens cooperating with each other. So um, I take it that you're like well read enough to be able to like speculate a bunch on like different forms of coordination. And I wonder how you would try to make sense of questions around like, oh, how do interstellar species coordinate? <clears throat> and yep. what risks might they face? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second is kind of an extension of that, um, a little bit off to the side as a separate question, is more like, OK, if they have an astroeconomy, then presumably they're going to need some kinds of like institutions of some kind. Uh, and then there's there may be risks to exploration. And I'd love to hear you also riff on that. Like, how would these alien civilizations manage their risk? What can mm -hmm. you think about in those terms? Yeah. Those are, those are fantastic uh, conclusions to go off of. Cooperation in terms of its manifestation is just as convoluted as competition um, in terms of where they reach for, what they find, and how they adapt and how they maintain. Uh, cooperation runs... Uh, I, I like to point to the Oatmeal comic where it talks about the parasitic worm and its life cycle, where it moves from the cow's stomach out the out the cow's bowels, the ant eats it, the ant becomes a zombie, and then the cow eats the zombie ant and the bacteria survives. That's technically an act of cooperation, They're forced admittedly to a degree, but it is cooperative in, in terms of its relationship. It's unbelievably convoluted, but that's what biology is good for is digging deep into the holes of every single efficiency that can be found and finding it and relying upon it. So that level of cooperation can get to that level of convolution. Um, and in terms of astroeconomics, um, even institutional relationships can get that convoluted as well. But again, that's just an extension of cooperation. I have to put a tariff here. I don't put a tariff there. Uh, this person has blackmail on me. This person's a buddy of mine at Harvard. Uh, th there are all these different types of cooperation schemes that take place in the micro that determine the opportunity costs and the opportunity windows. So the, the, the nature of cooperation in an astroeconomic empire will look just as convoluted as it does with any empire. I mean, take the Romans, for example. Their method of cooperation was to move into a town, execute all the military-aged men, and marry off the nobles to the, to the uh, powerful women of that area. That's technically a form of cooperation. Um, they didn't impose their Roman religions onto the locals. They knew the in insanity in trying to do so. Instead, they said, your religion is now part of our pantheon. That's, again, cooperation. So the, the cooperation is between players um, in which resources are needed or a buffer state is needed. Do these astro -econ economies have buffer states against one another? Eastern Europe has, has always been a buffer state between the Russians and the Western Europeans. Um, and they have a culture that is totally geared for that buffer state status. China is a master of building buffer states. So they, these are... These are um, all the things we should be seeing and should be looking for, and they will have unique signatures. Um, and from, from those signatures, if you can find them, you can then infer what the institutions are doing, if there are any, because you'll see a policy is being done here. Uh, trade happens at this time, exactly at this interval, exactly in this volume. And you can actually infer the presence of an institution just based on that alone, absolutely could. Uh, these are things that will absolutely show up in any of the energy signatures that, are, that can be detected in terms of astroeconomic um, you know, existence. Um, in terms of how they would do this, that is something I would love to follow up in private because I can expound upon that extensively. Any follow-up, Yuli? Sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, maybe I'll join the Dark Stoa community and uh, ask you a bit more. Yeah, please do. All right. So, um, Anjan, uh, since you started this, you can get the last question as well, uh, and then we'll, we'll close up. So uh, you're up. Ooh. Thanks, Peter. Um, how did the A survive AGI or superintelligence, or how the hell does superintelligence fit into the astroeconomic picture? Right. Um, that is an option tree exploration in and of itself. Um, Initial assumption would be that, well, I have to declare an axiom. I've been avoiding axioms quite a bit, despite making fun of people the entire time during my presentation. Uh, but there's one axiom I can speak of in some degree of confidence. And that is that no matter where life evolves, no matter what planet or conditions or organic chemistry compound, gravity will always be an essential part of that biological evolution no matter what that form takes. And that gravity component will be universal, meaning uh, a single cell 
organic compound growing and evolving and combining, figuring out where it can beat entropy and get its efficiencies and, and form better organizations on one another. Every iteration of that process is still going to be reliant on gravity. And the more mass it accumulates, the more gravity is going to affect it. And it, it has no choice in this evolution. So if life is to evolve on these astroeconomic frontiers, gravity will be one of the biggest constraints, more so than AGI. And here's why. We know that putting people in space destroys their biology. It fucks with their brains, it fucks with their hearts, it fucks with their bones and their blood flow. The ability to put biology in space for a long time, it's, it's, it's a bad idea. NASA doesn't release all this stuff because it's extremely bad PR, but it's terrible for, for the biology. So it actually makes more sense to send AI into space first. Limited AI, not, you know, not like super intelligence running around, but like robots running around doing mining, doing some of the work, bringing it back to a planet, maybe moving the pollution off the planet to some other planet. That would be the most logical step that anything would do. Now, either it could be a robot or it could be uh, something much more cruel where they just create a caste system of people who they throw up in the space and they don't care if they die. I think, you know, belters from the expanse or something like that. Um, so th there's all kinds of ways that can get around this, but it's that this, the, the gravity component is the biggest chain of all of them. And the super intelligence would, one of first starters, I don't buy into Kurzweil's interpretation of it. I think it's a joke, uh, but I will entertain the idea. Um, an intelligence that can improve itself will eventually have to reconcile the genomics of the species that created it. It will eventually run straight into it and say, here's your genes as they're aligned. Someone's going to take that power and say, either get rid of my enemies, ethno bombs, or improve myself, ethno boosts, right? And when you start doing that, um, you may engineer a way out of gravity, maybe. That's pushing it. You may fundamentally change your species and you all become Zerg from StarCraft. Who knows how that evolves? But the, the, it's, the, it's, it's the intersection of super intelligence and genomics. That's, I think, where a lot of the Fermi paradox may naturally occur. Because the moment you start tinkering with your genome, you're going to start tinkering with the brain that made the robot that can tinker with the genome. And the moment you start tinkering with that, all bets are off. Because you're, you're going to create Species that literally don't have the same morality as you, don't have the same language as you, same frames, same capacity as you, they got nothing. So you can't even reason about them. They can't reason about you. You've literally created something else. It's like trying to understand a beaver while electing it for president at the same time. What the fuck do you do? So um, it, that is one of the intersections I suspect will have to be crossed at some point. If any species is capable of making a compute, whether it is... Um, Long story short, there is an impulse to get to an organic composition that is hyper mutable, where you can change your composition either at will, or you can change your composition with assistance so that you can survive these transitions into, into non-zero gravity space. So I think the gravity pressure, um, I think super intelligence and gravity have a role to play together uh, involving limitations uh, in, involving overcoming the gravitational limitations. That's as far as I could see it, but even then that unlocks a whole lot of problems if you're not careful. So maybe that'll help. Yeah, cool, Ajahn. All right, um, so we'll close up here. Uh, another awesome session, Pat. Good to have you back uh, at the STOA. Uh, before I make closing announcements, any, any concluding thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? Well, thanks again for, for uh, spending your time with me on a weekend. I do or beginning of a weekend. I appreciate that. Um, join the Dark Stoa community. I'm out there yelling at somebody about something. So um, follow-up questions are always appreciated. Um, and, you know, listen to a lots of exopolitics by Muse to understand the upcoming days a bit more. Nice, nice. Cool. And uh, some people, I think they're going to do a uh, post um clubhouse uh, session uh, so uh, quips might be able to uh, create that uh, but pat thanks so much for coming to the stoa possibly more sessions with pat at the stoa so stay tuned um, another session coming up that you might like if you like this one 
Daniel Schmachtenberg is coming uh, June 9th. Uh, talk about the psychological pitfalls of engaging in extras and civilization redesign. Patreon events, so you can check that out. Um, yeah, so Pat, everyone, thanks so much. Absolutely. That'll be very related to this talk for sure. Mm. All right, so let's, let's get some views to bring us out. <laughs>